Afternoon, everybody. We're just uh, slowly letting some folks in, and Brenda will be joining us a second. She had to take care of the dog. <laughs> I do that important thing. Hey, everybody, look at this. Pop it in. Let's see where they're coming in from. Hi, everybody. As you come in today, if you'll do us a big favor, um, make sure that your cameras are on because this is the way we build community. If you would please rename yourself so that we know where you're coming in from. And if you're really feeling special today, really appreciate it if you jump into the chat and tell us where you're coming in from and what the temperature is. So here we are in mid-June. So we want to see as everybody comes in where you're at, what you're doing. Hey, I see Mr. Byer. I was just going to ask um, Mike if you'd talk to Chuck lately. So it's good to see Chuck in the house. Hey, popping in. Hey, Bob. Chris. Oh my goodness, Tampa. Yeah, we know that, Jeff. Ninety-five here <laughs> in Tampa. Thanks. Glad you're playing, though. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hamilton, New Jersey. Yep, yep. Come on. Ooh, I want to go to Denver. Seventy-seven. That's where I want to be right now. That would be kind of fun. Good stuff. Watch these people come in. It's so nice to see all of your faces, and it's so marvelous that everybody gets to. Um, start to learn who each other is by having these cameras on. And I know sometimes we just don't feel like being camera ready, but this group doesn't care. We just want to see your face whenever possible. So Jamaica. All right, Monique. That's oh, I want to go there. Let's hang out. Naples, Florida. Salt Lake. Oh, see, there it is. 78 again. Beautiful. Loving it. Got a great turnout today. You guys are in for a real treat as we get this thing kicked off here. Um, because we're going to learn a lot and have some fun while we do it. So as we get started today, um, Val, when you get a chance, if you can just, I'd like to go um, thank our sponsors today. If you can show everybody who our sponsors are. Pop that slide for me. Um, this is the organization that's built for you, by you, but these are the people that have given not only their time, but their dollars to help support us so that we can keep bringing you this kind of an opportunity to get together with each other um, and share. So um, environmental risk innovation, LCAM, you know, Boxwood Means, Real Wired, TREP, and Swift Real Estate Solutions. Thank you all very, very much. I hope that some of you out there take a snapshot and if you have an opportunity to do any business with them, uh, we appreciate supporting our sponsors where possible. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. One of my things that I love to do all the time is make sure that we start on time, rolling on time, get you out on time. And I like to reward those people that do show up on time. So we always start right away. So today, Val, when you want to pop up our other slide for us, I'm making her double tap, but she's good about it. Oh, we're going into members. All right, well, let's do that next. Mike, how about a few, uh, go ahead, Val, you can go back to members. Mike, can you give us a little uh, insight here and tell us what's going on with our membership? Yes, today I'll be playing the part of Rob, but I will not be playing music at the end, so you don't need to worry about me singing any more than I normally do, thank God. Unfortunately, Rob was called away. It's uh, had some challenges at home. Nothing bad, just a little, little stress and moving, I think, to another state, so he asked me to pitch in. We're really excited, and I mean that genuinely, about the membership and the level of interest. It, frankly, is a really nice feather in, in the cap of this organization that people see value in it and are, are truly in larger numbers starting to join, getting some real momentum. In fact, I think um, it's blocked on the bottom of my screen, but I think the newest members, Karen Davidson, if I'm correct, Valerie. So thank you, Karen. Here's some other folks that have joined us recently. If you don't mind going to the next slide, Valerie. A number of you have come on today uh, and just paid for a one-time meeting, which was certainly welcome to do, and, and we welcome you. But I'd encourage you to think about joining uh, more permanently. The single membership pays for itself in roughly four meetings, so the economics kind of makes sense. And, and by the way, that not only gets you the meetings that we have here today, but I would say just as importantly, the in-person meeting that we did in Tampa would be included. And then I think as Brenda's going to talk about or somebody will talk about later, we have our meeting cup in, coming up in New Jersey in October, and that would be included in your membership fee. One of the things I think that, that Brenda deserves a lot of credit for and Jeff and helping drive is this elevate, communicate, and educate. And we're really trying to do a lot of that today. Um, and simple things like being on screen so we can start to interact. But the thing that I'm most excited about when it comes to the communicate and the educate piece is the new um, Facebook group. 
that Jeff has been nice enough to put together with a lot of help, I believe, from Valerie. And although I must admit, I'm not on Facebook, I've seen some of the threads, and it's really a beautiful, robust discussion, and I think it parallels really well with our office hours concept. How much we'll need to do of both of those, I'm not sure. We'll sort of hopefully get some feedback from all of you as we progress so we can get in the right rhythm and the right methodology for you to come together with your peers to share ideas and ask questions. Along those lines, we'd welcome that feedback. So you can throw in the chat, shoot us an email. We're also going to be taking a hiatus. I think we'll talk about that in a minute, so I don't want to steal Brendan's fire. But I will ask that as you think about issues that are facing you, please don't be shy about raising your hand and asking us to bring them to the forefront. And what I mean by that, as we think about building content after we go on our summer break, having feedback from you as to what you'd like to see presented on, both in these meetings as well as our one-day in-person seminar in New Jersey, would be so helpful. With the next slide, okay. if you don't mind, Val. Sorry, Brenda. No, that's great. Um, All yours. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just love doing this, you know, once a month with Mike and team because we've built such an incredible friendship and we want you there too. I'm just going to back up just a minute on the, on the Facebook thing. The Facebook that we have put up is a private Facebook page. So the only thing we're really using is the platform um, for Fiverr so that we don't have to go out and recreate something in place for you guys to communicate with one another. Um, so, you know, it, no one else is out there. So this is your place to feel comfortable enough to share, ask questions and communicate and grow to know each other um, by one other place to get it done. And yeah, you know, our whole thing here is we're really passionate about the fact that, as I like to say, those that are in the valuation department inside of financial institutions are some of the smartest people there are when it comes to real estate. And you guys grow and get smart because you're not afraid of education. You're not afraid of continuous um, learning. But here's what we found and why we really got five of together. There just didn't seem to be that voice, you know, that voice so that there was a collective voice that could sometimes facilitate real change in the industry where needed. Um, either that we're having that kind of opportunity to talk to our government officials and things like having Eric as part of our um, founding team with the FDIC and then all of our friends um, from some of the various government regulations to really help us build it so that there's a big voice out there for crazy. So thank you for being here today. And uh, let's keep up this good work because like I say, smartest people in the room. Um, I have the distinct pleasure today to introduce our, our speaker, um, Daniel Lesser. And I don't know if any of you um, had a chance before coming to this meeting. Sometimes I like to prepare ahead of time to check him out. But his credentials speak for himself. There is no doubt about it. And we don't read credentials on this program. We just kind of talk and get human. So one of the things that uh, I asked Daniel about today, would he be willing to share with us something that... Um, you probably might not know about him as a person as opposed to this distinguished um, credentials that he has. And so here it is, are you ready? Daniel is an avid Corvette race car driver. Who would expect such a thing, right? Um, so I teased him a little bit and I said, so I think I get it. You gotta go inspect all these hotels all over the country everywhere. So I guess as you just drive around in a Corvette wherever you need to go so you can make that happen. So with that, Daniel, can you take us into your presentation? Let's go have some fun and get some learning done. Well, thank you so much, Brenda, for the invite and Jeff as well. Re really appreciate being invited to uh, to speak to everybody. And um, while I don't uh, drive my Corvette to every hotel I inspect whenever I'm available, when, whenever it's possible to rent a Corvette wherever I go, um, I take full advantage of that. Florida seems to be a great place to be able to do that. So. Great. Uh, is my presentation up? Can you see it? Nope, you need to do your share screen. Can you see yep. it now? Yes, we sure can, sir. And you see the full screen, right? Absolutely. Terrific. Terrific. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Well, I guess good afternoon from where I'm speaking. I'm not sure where everybody is here, but uh, again, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'm going to be talking about the um, uh, the U.S. lodging industry and what's going on uh, during the first half of this year, 2023, you know, with a focus on uh, clearly 
for all commercial asset types, uh, you know, lending has tightened up. Uh, same for hospitality hotels, and and there definitely are some challenges associated with uh, financing be, being available, and we're gonna we're gonna get into that. Um, so uh, my attorney makes me uh, put this disclaimer up uh, every time I give a presentation. You can read it, but basically what it says is don't believe anything I say, and clearly don't make any investment decisions based on what I say either. So, all right. Um, before I get going, I, I actually I want to read uh, I want to read something that I uh, I recently came across that I found very interesting. Um, wondering if anybody else has seen it, so indulge me for one minute here. It says in many of our larger cities, and also in a considerable number of medium sized localities, the hotel business has become demoralized as a result of ill conceived overbuilding programs. Capital in its continual attempts to find larger returns has recklessly been poured into hotel structures and promoters blinded by misconceived needs of their communities or by the hope that they could advance their private interests are the two fundamental causes that are responsible for this situation. Regardless of the reason, however, the fact remains that the hotel business as a whole is now suffering from this overproduced condition. Now, I would imagine many on who are listening in are saying, okay, um, and I'm curious, I, I guess we can't really have an interactive thing, but I wonder whether anybody uh, came across this piece that I came across as well. My guess is probably not. And the reason I say that is because it's the first paragraph of an article from Hotel Management Magazine in August, 1930. <laughs> kind of shows you that history does have a habit of repeating itself. Okay, let's talk for a minute about, you know, hotels and and uh, and what makes them different from other commercial real estate asset classes. Um, it's a fairly, uh, I have a fairly extensive slide deck here, so I'm going to go fairly quickly, but I understand that everybody will be able to get a copy of the slide deck for your perusal and your library if you would like. Um, I'm going to talk very high level. I'm not an economist, but very briefly about the U.S. economy because the hotel business is absolutely driven uh, by uh, the, the state of the economy. Uh, then I'm going to talk briefly about what's happening uh, again, high level in the uh, in, in the in the sector, the, the lodging sector, and then I'm going to go through a SWOT analysis: strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I'm an optimist at heart, so whenever I do this presentation, I always do threats before, and I end with opportunities, so we can end on a high note. Um, hotels, what makes them different? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, hotels are going business concerns that are intertwined with bricks and mortar real estate. And you know, unlike other uh, real commercial real estate asset classes um, that generally have, uh, take an office building, right? long-term uh, credit-worthy tenancies, right? A hotel is leasing up guest rooms every single night. And with technology being what it is today, uh, pricing of room rates literally changes by the nanosecond. In, a, in an up market, that's a beautiful thing. In a down market, it'll kill you. Um, there's a lot of complexity associated with uh, um, with the structure of, of, of hotels and ownership, you, you, you typically have a hotel owner, you typically have a hotel manager, you have, you have many cases, a hotel brand identification, um, a, a debt lender, equity investors, you have all these different parties. And uh, many times the interests of these various parties is not aligned. Something else to sort of consider about the operating aspects of hotels. If you think about a full service hotel, right? Heads and beds, room revenue. I mean, that's generally the largest uh, revenue stream that a, that a hotel generates, but lots and lots of hotels have food and beverage offerings and recreational offerings and even some retail. Um, so you have varied income streams uh, and then the, uh, the costs associated with those various income streams. Right. And, you know, the notion of of controlling costs associated with food and beverage is very different than the costs associated with putting heads in beds. So the bottom line is that the hotel business is a very complex and volatile business. 
One more thing to consider is reliance on intermediaries. And a, a great way to sort of uh, illustrate that point is think about uh, hotels on island locations where the only way to get there is either via a boat or an airplane, right? Well, if the transportation is not getting to that island, guess what? The hotel business is gonna, is gonna suffer. So hopefully this sets a backdrop of why hotels are you know, very different than other commercial real estate asset classes. And um, you know, I, I, hopefully nobody is gonna fall asleep uh, during this presentation, but just in case anybody does, I figured let me start with sort of the summary of, of, of what's, going out, uh, what's going on. So after the next couple of slides, if you wanna doze off, you won't miss too much. Um, so, so the bottom line is that um, it's very interesting. Lodging fundamentals in the United States remain really solid, despite a lot of a lot of noise out there. Um, you know, there's talk about whether we're in a recession, going in a recession. I mean, I, I, nobody really knows is the bottom line. Um, lately, when I've been giving this presentation in in, in person, I I, I, I ask the audience. Uh, to raise their hand if they believe that uh, uh, we are currently in an economic recession. And about a third of the room does do that. And then I ask those uh, to raise their hand who don't believe that the U.S. is currently in a recession, but we are definitely heading into one. And I get another third of the room. And then the third final question to which I raise my hand is, do you have any idea or do you not have any idea? And Nobody really knows because, I mean, this is the longest predicted recession I can ever recall, and I've been doing this for just a couple of years. Um, the sector, the, the lodging sector came back uh, uh, very, very strongly uh, after COVID. It, it was active uh, to the tail end of COVID with leisure travel, drive-to business, excuse me, drive-to leisure uh, travel, and corporate individual business and group convention business was definitely lagging. We are at the point now where uh, corporate and group business are coming back strong, particularly group. Corporate has a little bit more ways to go. Um, so now you have the industry sort of humming on, on all the traditional cylinders of where demand comes from, uh, corporate, group, and, and leisure. Um, Dan? I'm sorry. Dan, it's Michael. Yes. So... <laughs> Since you brought up this issue of group and, and corporate business coming back, we heard about the revenge trips or whatever it was called, where people were basically locked in and finally got a chance to go out. Is the same thing happening here on the corporate side? In other words, is this an anomaly or do you think some of the growth we're seeing on the corporate and business side will be here to stay? I believe it's going to be here to stay. It's not it's not revenge oriented. Listen, okay. you know, at the end of the day, don't get me wrong. It's not back to where it was. And I'm going to have slides that 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 show uh, that show this because let's face it, you know, uh, work from home. Um, my humble opinion, work from home is here to stay, and so we're never going to get back to uh, you know 100 percent of where we were in 2009. Excuse me, 2019 in terms of office occupancy. Um, but but you know, let's face it, uh, um, those uh, service providers, those vendors that go and see their clients to break bread, person, you know, eye to eye, right? They're generally gonna win out over the service provider or the vendor that just stays in touch by telephone or Zoom, right? There's nothing like uh, human face-to-face -face contact. It's, Amen. And so, and so it, it's coming back, the, the, there's no question about it. The beauty about the, of, of what happened uh, in terms of the rebound after COVID, um, was was average rates. Um, so in past downturns, the the industry had a bad habit of cutting room rates in anticipation of putting heads in beds. And this last go around, this last downturn during COVID, they did not do that. And I think it was realized early on that if you gave rooms away, people were not traveling, right? I mean, let's face it, we were we were under lockdowns and what have you. And so the sector did a really good job at holding rate integrity so that when we did come out of, out of COVID, we started out at a much higher average rate than on a relative basis than we did in past downturns. You know, it's very easy to cut your room rates. It's so much harder to raise them after you do that. Um, challenges, I mean, listen, we are in an inflationary environment. And uh, although 
the inflation environment is a positive for being able to raise room rates, right? It also gets eaten up quite a bit by expenses increasing uh, at inflationary and sometimes above inflationary levels. We're going to talk about that as well. Um, new supply is is a pretty good story in the lodging sector. It, it's it's below long term averages and it's anticipated to stay that way for quite some time. Again, we're going to talk about that, uh, you know, further. And generally speaking, um, money coming into the space is prior prioritizing acquisitions over uh, new construction. Uh, I'm going to be talking about transaction volume, which as of late has uh, slowed down. Uh, transaction volume, I'm not saying values have slowed down, but volume uh, vol values have not slowed down, but volume clearly has. And, you know, we'll be talking about the, you know, the reasons uh, for that happening. Um, there's going to be a tremendous amount of transaction activity starting the second half of this year, going into all of next year and probably into the year after. Uh, the fact remains, this is not an opinion, the fact remains that there's an enormous amount of of debt that's coming due. A lot of it is CMBS debt. And if you think about it, these deals were originated back when uh, interest rates were much lower than they are today. And so it's going to cause it's going to cause challenges for for folks that have uh, uh, debt instruments coming due. Um, other challenges will include uh, the fact that you know hotels have sort of kicked the can down the road in terms of doing what they call PIP programs, PIP product improvement programs, and we still have a rash of of hotels in America that have delayed uh, during COVID uh, renovation and very much needed. And obviously, you need money to do renovations. Um, so that's a brief summary of some of the things I'm going to be highlighting. Uh, if you'd like to stay awake, I hope, uh, I hope you do. So let's talk briefly about the, the U S economy. And again, you know, it, it's kind of all over the place, right here. I'm a big headline guy. So a lot of my slides are going to have, you know, headlines and, and they're all recent current headlines within the past six months or so. Right. And so here we have a whole slew of headlines from some fairly well-known folks, um, that are pretty, you know, pretty bullish on, on the U.S. economy. And again, the reason I'm talking about the economy is I'm not an economist, but clearly the state of the economy drives the demand for hotel rooms, right? So here we have all the optimists. Now, during sort of the same time frame, right, past six months or so, here we have sort of the, down, the, you know, the Debbie Downers, right? And these are all very well-respected people, right? Jamie Dimon, uh, uh, Warren Buffett, Barry Sternlicht, right? Um, they're a tad, you know, sort of concerned about uh, about the the United States uh, going going into into some sort of a recession, and there's all sorts of opinions as to how deep and wide that recession will be. Here is sort of the facts of where we stand today, right? And and the fact is that uh, um, the economy is still growing, okay. Um, the, 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 and the economy is anticipated to continue to grow when we look into the next couple of years, albeit at reduced levels of growth. But it's important to remember, it's growth nonetheless, right? Everything's relative in life. I was around in the early 1990s when uh, GDP was negative, right? So again, it's all, it's all relative. So the outlook is, 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 is pretty good. Uh, slow growth for the U.S. economy, whether we end up in recession or not. Briefly, interest rates, uh, um, you know, again, everything's relative in life. Today, interest rates are clearly higher than where they were 18 to 24 months ago. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. But when you look at long-term averages, a la 40 years uh, in history, right, interest rates today are really not that out of line with long-term averages. You know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that, uh, um, you know, this notion of, 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 of being able to borrow money for free was an, an anomaly. And we're probably not going to see that again, at least I don't think in my lifetime. The hotel sector, uh, you know, high level, wh wh where are we today? The hotel sector is doing phenomenally well. Um, revenues, uh, profits broke records in 2022. Um, they continue to uh, 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 indicate some very strong, um, healthy statistics. 
Interesting when you look back at uh, the last three major downturns, right? After 9-11, it took 41 months for the U.S. hotel industry to recover. After the great financial crisis in 2008, it took 59 months. And after COVID, it only took 28 months, which really illustrates the resilience of the travel sector. Uh, human beings are uh, innately wired to want to explore and, 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 and meet in person and see the world and, and experience different cultures. Um, and, and this, this you know, I think the fact that, I mean, let's face it, when COVID happened, right, call it March 15th, 2020, if you just kind of think about that point in time and don't, don't consider what we know happened after the fact, right, it was pretty dark pretty doomy and gloomy with not a whole lot of clarity of, of coming out of this. And so the fact that the hotel sector came back after 28 months is, is, is quite remarkable. You know, the bottom line is that even though, uh, you know, the economy is, is, is been fairly volatile, um, hotel fundamentals remain strong and they're anticipated to continue to remain strong, irrespective of, of what happens to the economy. And um, it's actually, I'm going to have a slide later on that shows a, a little bit of a divergence with history uh, about GDP and hotel demand, but that's just jumping ahead a little bit. Um, here we can see that the, you know, the forecasts for, for all the, you know, all the, all the metrics, whether it be occupancy, ADR, which is average daily rate, or REVPAR, which is revenue per available room, and it's the simple calculation of occupancy times ADR, um, and we can see that uh, um, the, the, all these all these metrics are anticipated to continue for the next several years. And um, you know, getting back to uh, uh, to parity with real 2019 dollars by next year. So again, an amazing uh, amazing story when you look at the various uh, chain scales from luxury all the way down to economy. For the most part, uh, they've all, you know, recovered nicely as well. Um, they're, you know, with that as a high level, and it's important to recognize that, you know, we do talk about the hotel industry nationally uh, and at a high level, but the hotel business always has been and always will be a neighborhood street corner business. And so you need to look at markets and then submarkets. Um, I'm domiciled in New York City. If you think about Manhattan, right? Manhattan is a very different market than, say, Brooklyn, right? And then just stick with Manhattan for a second, right? Midtown Manhattan is a very different market than the financial district in lower Manhattan. So it's a very, again, sub-market driven business. So uh, the table on the right, uh, you know, shows when we look at top 25 markets, there are clearly haves and have nots. And we can see on the far right, where, this is the right hand table. We can see, you know, lower, you know, lower right hand, uh, you know, Miami, Tampa, St. Pete, where my friends the Hicks are, uh, um, you know, booming, booming markets, right, from a hotel perspective. And on the other end of the spectrum, you know, unfortunately, you know, uh, San Francisco is getting a terrible rap these days in the media. Um, you know, granted, San Francisco is having a lot of issues. There's no question about it. The hotel market is hurting there. Also, no question about it. Um, but there's all sorts Daniel, of sensation. Daniel, yes. we did have a question. We've got some people from there. And I know when we did your, um, when we chatted earlier, you had some information about what happened in that San Francisco market. Are you going to cover that later? Or can we take a pause and kind of tell us what happened there with the, uh, with the Hilton? Uh, sure. I mean, we can talk about that now. Uh, so, you know, one of the big headlines about what's going on in San Francisco, uh, uh, particularly from a hotel perspective, but also from a, just a general perspective, is that two of the largest hotels in, in, uh, in downtown San Francisco, the Park 55 and the Hilton, are owned by a publicly traded hotel company by the name of Park, P-A-R-K, Park Hotels and Resorts. Um, Park Hotels and Resorts has announced uh, that they are no longer making uh, payments of debt service. It, uh, it's a CMBS structure. The note is coming due, I believe, in November. Uh, but they've announced that they're not going to be making uh, any more payments. Um, there's a lot of, again, sensational, sensationalism 
uh, in the media about this. I mean, headlines that, you know, Park threw the keys back to the lender. Well, Park did not throw the keys back to the lender. They said they're not going to be making any more payments. The note didn't come due yet, right? Many believe, me included, that this may very well be a negotiating tactic to work something out, right? And many of us know that, you know, like it or not, you know, if you're involved in a CMBS uh, uh, debt instrument, many times the only way you're going to get anybody's attention is by doing something as dramatic as that, right? Because generally speaking, it's it's hard to figure out, like, okay, who do I talk to? Um, by the way, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but, you know, I, I if I was betting, that's what I would bet on. Listen, San Francisco is a world-class city. It's a beautiful city. It has a tremendous amount to offer. Um, it's got a lot of problems. I am a big believer, not only in San Francisco, but in downtown urban cores throughout America, whether it be New York, Chicago, Boston, DC, San Francisco. Urbanization is a phenomenon that's been around for a long time. It's not going away. People like to live, work, and play, particularly younger folks, in major urban markets. And I underscore uh, um, live, work, and play. I underscore the work. That doesn't necessarily mean they want to go into an office building, right? But they do want to live, work, and play in downtown urban locations. Thanks, All right, Daniel, for taking that side so that we could have some commentary on it. Appreciate no that. problem. No problem. Um, so let's first talk about some of the some of the strengths uh, uh, that's that's going on in the sector. You know, it's kind of amazing. Uh, Americans are are spending money like crazy. I mean, that's what the that's what the headline says, and and that's candidly what's going on. And uh, you know, part of part of this discretionary uh, capital is being spent on travel, entertainment, and the like, and that obviously includes staying in hotels. I'm convinced that it's every American's God-given right to go on vacation, whether they can afford it or not. I've seen in other downturns, you know, it's like just people are going to do what they do. So that's a real positive for the sector. Um, this is this is the the table I was alluding to earlier. Is that um, hotel demand typically is very highly correlated to uh, to gross domestic product, and this year is is the first time that we're going to see a divergence in terms of change in gross domestic product relative to change in room night demand. And, you know, whether this is an anomaly or 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 something that's going to continue forever, nobody really knows. Uh, but it is an interesting phenomenon, nonetheless. Um, think about, um, um, well, I'm going to talk about airlines in a minute. Revenue per available room, uh, which is, again, uh, uh, occupancy times room rate. Is 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 back to 2019 levels. Profitability is strong, anticipated to remain uh, uh, fairly stable. And uh, Marriott just recently announced that their 2022 EBITDA was the strongest in its history. Marriott is the largest hotel company in the world, or one of the largest hotel companies in the world. Again, speaks volumes as to how how strong the fundamental uh, metrics for the sector is. Uh, we talked about group meeting travel. It's 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 coming back really strong. When you look at at uh, um, forward bookings, uh, they they are strong in 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 most cities, and we can see that uh, um, uh, host hotels and resorts, which, which again is a a publicly traded hotel REIT. All they do is own hotel properties. They're very bullish on 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 uh, 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 group meetings and. The second headline, uh, event software software provider Cvent, was uh, was purchased by Blackstone. That says something, right? Blackstone, uh, I think they kind of know what they're doing. Uh, the airlines, right? The airlines are doing phenomenally well. If you've been on a plane the last couple of weeks, couple of months, any plane that I've been on, I have there've been no empty seats. They are running absolutely full, and on top of that, airfares are through the roof. And the fact that airfares are are going up as 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 dramatically as they are is a is a is a uh, is a tremendous sort of drag effect in a positive manner for the lodging industry, right? Travelers are saying, okay, I got to pay a lot more to to fly on a plane. Well, guess what? I'm going to have to pay a lot more to stay in a hotel as well. And if you think about it, 
Um, while inter international visitation is back inbound into the United States, it's not back anywhere as to what, where it was in 2019. And so it's slowly coming back. You know, uh, most thought that, that when China uh, reopened, the Chinese would come back here immediately in droves. And that has happened fairly slower than people expected originally. But that's a good thing, you know, in the next, in the next year or so, because they will come back. The international travel will definitely be back. There's no, there's no question about it. And then these are just a slew of headlines, um, you know, talking about, uh, uh, um, you know, the positive aspects of, you know, demand and revenue uh, for hotels. This is the first time now we're seeing this. Uh, this is in the in the top middle headline, leisure travel. If you haven't heard that term. It's a term I'm not very fond of, but it's a combination of business and leisure. And there is really something to it. I just don't like the term uh, in that, uh, um, you know, whereas Thursday, you know, in years past was typically checkout night for hotels. Thursday has now become a big check in night. Right. So people come in do their business on Thursday during the day, stay over Thursday night, finish up Friday and then stay Saturday, Sunday, and maybe even until Monday with leisure activities. Hence, be business, leisure, leisure. And we are seeing a lot of that going on. And so, it, you know, it's sort of changing the mix uh, of, of, of where the demand is coming from um, within the lodging sector and something that everybody is, uh, is, is focused on. Um, I mentioned earlier that supply, uh, new supply growth is, uh, is, is fairly muted. Um, it's below, it's below, you know, long-term averages. Listen, the fact remains that, uh, and we're going to talk about financing challenges uh, in general, but uh, construction financing uh, is a challenge to obtain for a hotel these days. Um, and if you can obtain it, uh, you're going to pay dearly. And I cannot imagine that too many projects uh, without some sort of a subsidy um, become economically feasible with the cost of construction debt today. So that's a good thing for existing owners. Uh, you know, during COVID uh, and for several years since, so during the past three, three and a half years, we've had a number of hotels throughout the country, particularly on both coasts, permanently close. And they were either closed uh, um, for conversion to alternative use or to be scraped for development of some, some new use that may possibly include a, a hotel component or maybe a new hotel. Uh, the reality is that there, there, there always has been and probably always will be no shortage of, of hotels in America that are physically, functionally obsolete and many also you can add economically obsolete as well. And so what COVID did was sort of push many of these over the edge in terms of no longer being economically viable. With that being said, there's also been no shortage of, of uh, 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 extended stay hotels and fairly new ones. When I say fairly new, I'm saying, you know, within 10 years, uh, particularly in California, you know, that were purchased for uh, um, conversion to house the homeless. And uh, it's sort of a beautiful thing when you get uh, municipalities who don't know a whole lot about real estate and definitely know, don't know a whole lot about hotels, you know, buying hotel uh, properties for these conversions. And many of them have traded at some pretty healthy numbers. Daniel, can I ask Dan, a Sorry. About that? Let me just, let me just, let me, let me just finish. Let me just finish one thing here. It's important, you know, in other commercial real estate asset classes, um, I'm not an expert in other commercial real estate asset classes, but generally, I believe people talk about net new supply. For some reason in the hotel industry, nobody ever talks about. They just talk about new supply. And think about New York City right now. The word on the street in New York City, you may have heard about all these migrants that are getting shipped up to New York. Right now in New York, the word on the street is that 25,000 rooms out of about 125,000 rooms total, 25,000 rooms are offline accommodating homeless and immigrants, right? Think about the compression that does for the New York market. Brenda, go ahead. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Mike, ask your question first. I have a feeling we're on the same path here. We'll see, I, I, we'll see. I had two. I'm gonna go with the one that's my best guess. You can't, Dan, you talked about the changes in COVID and I think COVID produced some winners and losers 
I'm from New Jersey, as you may recall. And a lot of those non-branded smaller hotels along the coastline did very well because people were afraid to or couldn't fly. What are those, how do those properties perform afterwards or maybe more broadly, who are the post COVID winners and losers? The post COVID winners and losers. Well, I think we've already alluded to from a locational aspect who some of the losers are with San Francisco, obviously being a loser, Miami, you know, being a winner. If you're talking about asset class, uh, independent versus branded, it's really going to depend on the market, if you will. So you're talking about Jersey, right? And the Jersey Shore. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I own a home up on, on Cape Cod. And, uh, you know, the word up on the Cape this summer is that the rental market for re renting your house uh, 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 on the Cape this summer has been seen a dramatic fall off. Why? Uh, because Americans are now traveling overseas after all these years, right? So I would imagine if, you know, home rentals are down on the Cape, so is transient visitation, right? But I would not characterize it as winners and losers. Listen, uh, during COVID, all that drive to business on the Jersey Shore or the Cape was phenomenal. Don't get me wrong, right? It's now sort of coming back to more normalized levels. Okay. I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you, Dan. Okay. My, so we were a little bit off, but I was in line with Catherine, um, who just put something in the chat. Um, and I don't remember, Danielle, can you give us any insight into what happened before when we were um, looking at the competition of the Airbnbs compared to what might be happening more currently? I have a slide on that. We'll be getting to that. Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. Um, Strengths, uh, um, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, hotel transit uh, transaction activity uh, has definitely dropped uh, Q1 of this year, even more so Q2 of this year. There's an expectation that it's going to build back up beginning second half of this year. Uh, what's interesting, and I'm going to talk more about this later on, is, is there's a lot of money out on the sidelines looking for a home and chasing yield. And uh, in an inflationary environment, hotels are perceived to be a, uh, a desirable asset class because of, again, the notion of being able to continuously change your rates, right? In an up market, it's a beautiful thing. And in an inflationary uh, environment, uh, being able to change your rates by the nanosecond is, is also a beautiful thing. Um, what's amazing, the bottom headline, uh, and this is a recent headline, hotels are increasingly a preferred asset class for active investors. This is a co-star headline. I've been doing this for more than 40 years. I don't recall ever um, hearing or anybody believing that hotels were perceived as a preferred asset class compared to office buildings, right? And yet that's what's going on today. Um, pretty interesting. And here's a table showing that exact, uh, that exact phenomenon. It's, uh, it's, it's really, very, very unusual and has never happened before, at least not in my career. Uh, I talked a minute ago about inflation. Uh, Blackstone loves the hotel business. Blackstone is amazingly skilled at uh, entering and exiting the sector at the right time. Uh, and I would say not so much the sector, uh, but more, you know, they, they, know, they know when to buy what and when to sell what. Um, they, they definitely believe that currently the, the real opportunity in the sector is that, is that hotels are a terrific hedge against inflation. And many other knowledgeable hotel investors uh, believe the same thing. Daniel, is that because of the ability to change pricing almost on the fly? Does that help? Correct. That's 100%. Exactly. Okay. And, and daily leasing. Correct. Yep. Right? Um, let's talk about financing. First, let's talk about refinancing. You know, there's lots of talk out there about, oh, there's no financing. That is far from correct. There is financing out there, all types of it, whether it be refinancing, acquisition, and there's even some construction financing. The, the fact is, though, that it's going to cost money to borrow money today. And that's really, I mentioned that earlier, that's what the challenge is, right? And so, you know, just the first half of this year, here's a whole slew of refinancing you know, transactions that have occurred in the hotel space. Here's a continuation of that previous slide, right? No shortage of deals, 
name brand properties, name brand lenders. There's money out there. It just requires repayment of some sort of principal and return on that money. Here's another continuation of it. There's, there's refinancing money out there. There's no question about it. There's acquisition money financing. Again, all these slides are from the first half of this year. This is not stale information. Um, I've, got to, I've got to stop you on this one. This is because um, our, our members that are out here today watching this, um, a lot of them are going to be in looking at appraisals on smaller properties. Um, can you kind of talk about where the strength of those smaller properties and the availability of funding is with them in addition to all of these that are up in the, you know, several hundreds of millions of dollars? Um, yeah, but not all of these are necessarily uh, that case. When you say smaller properties, uh, I would imagine you're talking about, you know, 100 rooms, select service hotels. You know, even a, you know, $5 million property, $10 million property. The, 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 there's regional banks are are offering are offering and we're going to see um let me see I, I have some here hang on a second here uh here you see my arrow by the way does my arrow show up no no okay so lower left hand corner mm -hmm. skokie to loan developer four and a half million dollars to build hilton hotel downtown right uh if you go to the right hand side of the table, one, two, three down, town of Speedway to provide two and a half million dollar construction loan. Wait a so minute, really... town of Speedway? Tell us yes. about that. <laughs> uh, that's in Indiana and um, they're they're doing this because they want to spur uh, economic development, economic in, development. In, in the market, yes. Um, oh, by the way, here we are on construction financing, right? Again, this is all this year. The earliest headline is January, the latest one is May. Um, Again, there's money out there. Thank you. More construction money. There's a bit of M&A going on. I say a bit because it's not a huge amount, but lots of folks are gearing up for it. Company out there called Newcrest Image. Uh, in March, they acquired 11 hotels at the beginning of the month. And later that month, they acquired 16 hotels. This is a group that uh, during COVID sold a portfolio of over 100 hotels that they owned. And so they're recycling capital. And then, you know, here again on the right-hand side, we see our friends at Blackstone. They've closed the, the largest real estate fund ever that they raised, 30 billion. And they've definitely come out and said that hotels are part of the, uh, the, the uh, where that money is gonna go to. So very interesting. When we look at the first half of the year, there, there have been uh, some pretty significant sales uh, particularly the, the the top two, the Diplomat in Hollywood, Florida, and the JW Marriott in uh, in San Antonio, uh, 800, 835 million dollars. These are thousand room properties, convention oriented hotels. Probably won't see stuff like this built new for at least the next ten years. Uh, if you do the math, uh, 800 or 835 divided by a thousand, right? 800 thousand dollars per room, eight hundred thirty-five thousand dollars per room. Those are pretty healthy numbers. These are also one of a kind assets. Again, uh, these are being purchased by institutional investors who know and understand the hotel business. It speaks volumes about um, how they perceive the future of the sector. And then between a hundred and one hundred sixty-five million dollars, we've had uh, about eight trades thus far this year. So again, there's there's. The activity has slowed in total, but there's there's some good activity going on. When you look at the profile of who's buying hotels these these days, these are the organizations who uh, who have purchased properties, hotel properties in America, so far this year. This is a who's who within the lodging investment space. You may not have heard of some of these folks if you don't play in the in the lodging space every day, but. I can tell you this is a who's who. It's also a, a bit of a who's who of non-hospitality uh, players. Uh, Simon, right, the big mall owner, is now investing in hotels. They just bought their first property, and they have they have more money earmarked for the lodging space, which is kind of interesting, right? Uh, I guess it is kind of interesting, particularly when you look at what happened to retail. But that I guess is a whole other story. Uh, weaknesses. 
Um, I mentioned earlier about Americans uh, are traveling abroad now, right? And that's definitely putting negative pressure uh, on, you know, leisure demand here here in the in this country. Work from home, right? I spoke about that earlier. I am firmly in the camp of believing it's never coming back to where it was. Uh, according to Castle Systems, uh, which is not the best source in the world, but it's a pretty good source. Um, in you know major urban markets in America, only 50% of office occupancy is back to pre-COVID levels. Um, you know, the longer that this phenomenon drags on, I, I really believe the chances of of getting back to 100% occupancy diminish. And like I said a, 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 a couple of minutes ago, I I think that train has left the station and is not coming back. That's not a great thing for the lodging sector from a corporate business perspective. It's not a bad thing though for the group meeting business because with less people going into the office and doing meetings like this, right? These are great meetings. Zoom is a fantastic thing. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, right? Video technology has been around for 20 years but it really only got discovered during COVID. Um, Skype has been around forever, right? And I don't know how Zoom all of a sudden came and, and over and became Kleenex, but it did. Anyway, um, um, where am I going with this? Um, you know, as folks do meetings like this, there's a need, and we're seeing it happen, for people that work together to physically get together more often than they did pre-COVID. So corporate individual travel may not get back to, to pre-19 level, uh, pre-COVID levels, but group meeting. Uh, and convention business should and may even exceed because of this need for uh, uh, people who work together to meet in person. Uh, weaknesses, expenses uh, are clearly, uh, you know, a challenge. Uh, um, let's hold operational expenses aside for a second um, and look at, you know, insurance costs, um, which I mean, we, we heard announcements by two major insurance companies that they're not going to insure homes in California anymore, State Farm and I believe Allstate, right? I mean, you got to figure that commercial is not too far behind it, right? And we have seen insurance costs for hotels go up dramatically, and that's not going down anytime soon. Tremendous weakness. Um, labor has been a real struggle for the sector. Uh, you know, when 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 hotels shut down during COVID and laid off folks, um, many people went on to go do something else and never came back to the hotel business. Working in hotels is not an easy proposition. Hotels never close. They're 24-7 operations. You work long hours. Um, the pay can sometimes be challenging. And so uh, the staffing shortages uh, like other businesses, but have, but have been very acute in the lodging sector, and uh, it's still it's still a challenge. Now, on the flip side, and we're going to talk about this later on, the hotel business is taking advantage of technology to make up for some of those for, for some of those challenges. Um, labor costs are going up dramatically, and then uh, uh, hotel labor unions in this country are strong and getting stronger. And so that definitely provides negative pressure for, you know, hotel, hotel operators. Um, for some reason, Daniel, I'm going to interrupt you again, because um, we're, we're coming close to our, our five minute warning on this. But I, I think if you could give us some ideas, I mean, you were not only, you know, an expert witness on hotels. I mean, your credentials are just out the yin yang when it comes to this kind of stuff. And this knowledge is just crazy. I wish we had another hour to, to do this. What if you were these appraisers, uh, chief appraisers, appraiser managers are on this call? Can you give us a high level overview? You know, they're not real familiar that, you know, their banks don't loan on hotels exclusively and it's probably not their biggest asset class. Can you give us some things to look out for, some things to watch for, how to get, you know, have confidence in the appraisals that they're getting in? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, listen, it, this is a specialized asset class. If I haven't demonstrated that until this point, <laughs> then I, I don't know, probably somebody else ought to, ought to give a presentation here. It's a very different asset class. I would highly suggest that anybody who's looking to get a third party appraisal on a hotel 
and this is not an advertisement, but no, the, rea not the reality is that you really should be looking to a specialist who all they do is focus on lodging, hotels, resorts, casinos, conference centers, timeshare properties. That's all I work on. That's all I've ever worked on for 40 plus years. Uh, I'm a hotel school graduate. I worked for Hilton for a number of years in operations at the New York Hilton Hotel, 2000 room property. I went through every sub department within food and beverage, every sub department within rooms. I know and understand the hotel business backwards and forwards from an operational perspective. I own hotels. I have interests in, 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 in hotels. I've been a borrower. I, I've done it all in the lodging sector. And, and it's, it's, it's important when you're trying to figure out the value of an asset, particularly a hotel, to be an expert in that asset class. And so that's that's the answer. Well, that's yeah. that's my initial. Well, and answer. I think that that's hard for us to do. And I know that these, you know, um, our our members are responsible for maintaining, you know, vendor lists and having those. If in fact they had something, um, and they maybe didn't, yeah, you know, maybe they couldn't afford you. Maybe it wasn't going to work out. Would you take calls from people, and can you help them, guide them as to, you know, if it wasn't you, who else they might be able to rely on? Well. Let me answer the first first part of the question. Uh, um, I take calls all day long, uh, and and I get, a lot of people call me to pick my brains, and I'm always happy to help out. Um, no, I'm not going to assist in finding somebody else to do what I do. Um, that's that. Yeah, I'm not in that business. Is there any asset class of hotel that you don't want to do? Like, do you do the mom and pops or run the beach? It's a two million dollar deal. I do fifty room inns on the side of the road, all the way up to 5,000 room casino hotels in Las Vegas and everything in between. I that do means. offs, I do portfolios. Last year we did a portfolio, we did appraisals on 194 assets throughout the United States. We touched all the real estate, produced appraisal reports. This is for a major lender uh, um, in th three weeks. Wow. Hey Brenda, I, th I think what uh, Michael, Daniel, we, we talked about it. If you have, what would be the downside if you had a good appraiser that doesn't specialize in lodging? What areas of the report would you expect? Wow, they really, is it the enterprise, FF&E? What, where would somebody that's maybe a good appraiser but not a lodging specialist, where the, might they fall down in evaluation? So if I was a chief appraiser, what should I look out for? Good appraiser, but not a specialist. Um, well, it, 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 understanding the historical income and expense uh, statement for a hotel. Hotels have, uh, hotels utilize a, a unique uh, um, a format that's known as the uniform system of accounts for hotels. And the way it's structured, it, it has the revenue. So rooms, food, beverage, other, right? Then it has uh, departmental expenses, which are expenses associated with each one of those revenue streams. Then you have what's called undistributed operating expenses, right? Energy, marketing, uh, uh, administrative in general, right? Those are expenses that, that cross the entire enterprise. And then you have fixed charges of cost, of course, uh, insurance, property taxes, uh, reserve for replacement. Let's talk a minute about undistributed operating expenses. Although there is this accepted format, Many, many uh, operators do divert somewhat from the format, and they might put uh, franchise fees in administrative in general, whereas part of it should be in the uh, marketing uh, uh, line, right? Uh, so if franchise fees are in administrative in general, right, and then uh, somebody who doesn't know and understand the hotel business then embeds a franchise fee without realizing that it's already in the administrative in general, they'd be double dipping. So that's just sort of, and I've seen that happen many, many times. So that's digging just into the income side is incredibly important. I'm gonna go out on a limb here because I'm gonna think yeah. that we're getting into some really good meat. I'm seeing some things that people are asking. Um, we do a, a, a post FIVA wrap up. If in fact you want to have the link to come to the post FIVA wrap up where Daniel will be for at least another 10 minutes or so, Put it in the chat that you want to do that and then we can get a couple more of these questions um, up and out because otherwise 
I'm going to be in trouble because we got an hour to get you in here and an hour to get you out of here. And uh, as I think um, somebody told me in showbiz, you always want to leave and want more. So I know we didn't make it through everything Daniel had today. We will invite him back another time. But Thank if you, you want to come in for a few extra minutes because you got some questions, come on into our post party. And with that, we don't have Mr. Rob Landis um, to take us out in a song today. So that makes us a little sad. But uh, Mr. Eric Daigley, are you still on the call? Can you uh, tell us what's going on next? No, I think we lost him. No, no, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. I, just, I was trying to try to respond to somebody here at the office. I apologize. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't real sure if I'd even have time to say anything. But, uh, you know, with, with Rob's normal send off, we, we normally get a chance to hear something that's really entertaining. But, you know, they've, they've asked me to kind of sum up the meeting. And, and I, you know, I think we're going to talk about it a little bit more. But just to help sum it up, I just wanted to bring in a friend of mine. Hold on a minute. What are you doing? Are you, are you done doing your presentation, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. So Daniel was telling us that uh, we have, uh, you know, some uh, some things going on in the hotel industry. You know, it's uh, the solid, strong and resilient, you know, kind of markets that uh, just like myself, you know, I'm very much so. And uh, the other <laughs> thing is, you know, this this market is, is, you know, it's complex and volatile. Like I can be, you know, and then beyond that, though, it's very strong. Things are going well, right? Except I don't like Francisco. your muscles, Arnold. Thanks, yeah. Arnold. Thank you, Arnold. <laughs> All right, I'll see that you later. Was great. Thank you. all Okay, that was that was Arnold. Uh, anyway, that was Arnold. Thank, thank thanks, you, Arnold. Thanks for your time. Eric Daigley could be Arnold Schwarzenegger. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Arnold. All right, now, Valerie, we're going to be a little off shelter today so if you can i know i threw yeah. that at you so yeah, as tim has a question out, i hope we can get people to sign back in or we yeah. just stay here yeah you want to stay here because tim uh, has a question yeah let's just stay on let's for just a few stay here. Stay here i think that'll yeah. be easier yep yeah it'll be easier than blasting out links yep. let's do it and anybody that can stay can stay this is the casual part post party are you ready <laughs> yeah okay. tim has a question but i didn't know what bev meant beverage Business enterprise value. Oh, I'm not a lodging guy. Thank you. <laughs> Bev. Did Tim sign off? Uh, no, Tim's right there. Daniel, you, do you see the question? You want me to read I, it to uh, you? No, you... Where, where is it? Uh, look in the chatty chat on the bottom left of the green thing. Tim, um, why don't you just unmute yourself and ask your question, my friend? Yeah, that's even me. He's not shy. Yeah, no, I'm not shy. So thank you for taking the question. So the question, um, I'm not looking at it. I guess I could look at it. Um, in the chat was. I can read it if you don't have it. So, so we get hotel appraisals and we've had them on some high, high uh, uh, recognition hotels. Let's say it's a Marriott or an AC or a Hilton, whatever, right? And the appraisers, the biggest weakness I see is they don't know how to estimate, determine, derive, or provide business enterprise value. And a lot of them will just say, we haven't included any. And my concern to that is, is we lend on the real estate component of that going concern, not the overall going concern. And if they don't allocate any business enterprise value it seems like they're inflating the real estate value i mean if you have all of the the um networking and the marketing from these major hotel franchises and they have the online registration and they have the links and all of these things that come with being a hilton for example and then they say there's no business enterprise value. That seems shocking to me. What's your take on that? Oh, I have a pretty uh, a pretty strong take on it. I've written extensively on this topic. And uh, let me put out there to begin with that uh, I was Steve Rushmore's first hire when he founded HVS back in 1980. Um, has nothing to do with the fact that uh, I was his first hire. Uh, however, his, uh, his, what he wrote about back then, the methodology, uh, endures today in terms of being reflective of how investors, knowledgeable, sophisticated hotel investors, 
price assets. And what they do is they end up stripping out any income, income attributable to going concern. And what they end up capitalizing is income that is attributable to real and personal property. There is no hotel investor on the planet that I have ever encountered who ever heard the term BEV or business enterprise value. All of that, uh, all of that uh, um, work that has been developed and published by advocates, essentially for advocates who focus on uh, property tax disputes, it, it's mythology. It does not reflect the actions of the marketplace. And an appraiser is supposed to reflect the actions of the marketplace. Again, uh, hotel investors, they, they never heard of BEV or business enterprise value. They're buying real and personal property. Interesting. Anybody well, else got any be, questions be, for be, Daniel? I'm going to follow up with that because I think um, Tim right brought up this is a, a very good question. And, and I'm being a little tongue in cheek here, Daniel, so forgive me, but how do I explain that to a regulator? <laughs> Have them call me. <laughs> <laughs> wish it were that easy and there there, 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 there there are all sorts of treatises and articles and candidly court cases that that uh, that acknowledge that that's the way the market works i mean it's you know there are i mentioned before uh, uh park hotels and resorts right the group mm -hmm. that that yeah. uh, san francisco tossed the keys back in san francisco right that's a publicly traded real estate investment trust that all they do is invest in hotels. That's it. They don't manage any of the hotels. Um, they use third party managers, right? They're investing in real and personal property. They're looking for returns that are higher than uh, say an office building investor, right? Because of the volatility associated with hospitality, right? And the riskiness associated with constantly changing occupancy and room rates, right? Um, I actually have a, a, I did a, I did a presentation yesterday in front of the Massachusetts Association of Assessing Officers uh, mm. about this very topic. And uh, it's a separate slide deck that I, I, I was able to pull out of another publicly traded REITs 10Q, uh, Pebblebrook Hotel Trust, uh, where they specifically state that we are passive investors. We're buying the real estate. We have no control over the management. We may be stuck with an operator who's not doing a credible job. That's the market. Do you think, Daniel, when we send out um, this presentation to the attendees, you might be able to share a link to maybe one of your blog posts or articles that you think of all the ones that you've written on this issue that we should take a look at. I know personally, I'd, I'd love to read it. I'll send you several of them. Absolutely. All right, great. Thank you. Be really helpful. Um, I know one of the things that we brought up earlier, and then we, you know, just ran out of time, which is horrible, was the impact of um, the Airbnbs and stuff like that. Do you want to take just a couple of minutes and give us a little detail on that? Sure. So you know, Airbnb is interesting. Um, you know when it. <laughs> When it first evolved, uh, um, there was a lot of concern uh, within the lodging sector about how it was going to, you know, potentially erode uh, demand for hotels as people would, you know, start using Airbnb in its place. And you know, I'm one of those folks who, you know, am curious and have, on from a business perspective and from a leisure perspective. Uh, rented Airbnbs several times years ago when it first became a thing. And it was such a hit or miss proposition that today I, I will, I, I, there's no way I'll, I'll, I'll do Airbnb because you just don't know what you're going to get, right? Uh, you know, the pictures are Photoshopped, what have you. Listen, when you walk into a Marriott branded hotel, there's a perception of what you're going to get. And generally speaking, you do get that. Now, I'm not saying that there are not some Marriott branded hotels that could use a hug and a kiss and <laughs> haven't seen renovation dollars in a while. Um, um, 
the, some of those do exist, but generally speaking, you you the you you there's a reason why people are into brands, right? Because there's a perception of what you're going to get, and generally speaking, that's what you get. With Airbnb, you just don't know what you're going to get, and you know there have been all sorts of security issues with Airbnb. Um, uh, there's no amenities, right? Uh, um, uh, there are hidden fees with Airbnb, all sorts of scams that go on. You know, what's going on now, and, and I, I'm not sure if it's on this slide, but I saw recently a headline that, that was uh, stated something about Airbnb bust. Now, I don't think it's busting. However, um, you know, the bloom is off the rose. Uh, Airbnb is clearly a, a player. They're not going away, but it's not as much of a threat to the hotel sector as it originally was when it first came around, and it clearly is not as much of a threat as folks thought it would end up being. And again, look at these headlines, kind of speaks, it speaks to all of this. And finally, you have a lot of municipalities that are saying, no, 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 you can't do this anymore. You can't, you can't do this and not pay us taxes, right? Because we got to collect money, right? Uh, and then you have, you know, you have uh, municipalities like the Dallas City Council, bottom headline, bans uh, short-term rentals from single-family zoned areas. We're seeing more and more of this going on. New York City has a strong uh, ban against Airbnb to the point that Airbnb has just recently announced that they're suing the city of New York. So again, they're out there, but it's, uh, it's a different animal and it's really not a, a big threat to the sector. And, and I just wanted to add one thing to that if I could real quick. You know, it's not just the cities that are doing that. It's HOAs. A lot of people aren't even thinking about that. But I'm I happen to be the president of my HOA right now. And uh, we we enacted a rule that that stopped, you know, the use of those kind of things um, in our neighborhood. And we're also doing some other things to make it really, really difficult for people to break the laws or break the rules. So the HOAs have a lot of power, too. Thanks, Eric. Hey, Daniel, yep. I really appreciate your time today. I have another question from Bob Huner. If you want to come on, Bob, and ask your question. Uh, hey, Daniel. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, in your opinion, what's the best way to handle a PIP uh, at, at time of the appraisal? I mean, we're always looking at the value as of a certain date. Should we plug in a PIP at the time of the appraisal or spread it out over the, the whole term? How would you see it? Great question. It's definitely something that needs to be considered, uh, particularly if it's if it's a brand affiliated property, because that uh, when a property sells or or uh, there's some sort of capital event is the trigger for the brand to basically say, OK, now you have to do X, Y and Z. How should it be considered from a valuation perspective? It really depends on the specific asset and what kind of condition it's in, um, you know, on some occasions, we've, you know, we, we, we investors again. That's how we what we do. We reflect what investors do. And if they're if they're pricing a, you know, a beat up days in that's got an amazing location and would 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 uh, with the right amount of money going into it would make a great repositioning opportunity for a full service Marriott. Uh, and it would take 18 months to to do that. I would say you need to take that capital deduct over 18 months, right? Uh, if not right up front. And if you take it over 18 months, you know it's it's a short enough time period that on a PV basis is not going to make that much of a difference when you take it up front or over 18 months. If it's a full service Marriott that needs a PIP, uh, and the brand is allowing that PIP to occur over a three year period. Um, I would say it's it's then reasonable to map it out over that three year period. Thank but you. definitely, yeah. it, it needs to be considered one way or the other. There's no question about it. Thank that you. always reminds me, Daniel, when people are doing valuations, and you know, let's say that the property was on the tax rolls at a quarter of what it should have been. The sale comes in and triggers it, and the appraiser, you know, just didn't think about it. Oh my God, their taxes are going to you know, triple and how that's going to impact the income statement. So absolutely um, very, very similar situation. Well, listen, Danny, you've been so gracious to give us Thank extra you. time. We like to have a lot of fun at this after party thing. Um, where'd Eric go? I can't see him again. Eric, uh, 
as we leave, will you tell us about that new image that you just put up behind you? Yeah, hang on a second. I'm sorry. I was just, okay. I was looking for something else and I just, uh, yeah. So 90 years ago, last Friday, we signed the FDIC Act. You can see FDR and his buddies behind him there. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's been said that, that, that somebody in my family may have been there. So I don't know if you can see that person <laughs> or not. But uh, anyway, uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, so 90 years anyway, ago. I think I was at a meeting with you when you shared that, and you actually <laughs> pointed out and had uh, some. You can see him. Uh, the mustache right, right there, there, baby. Oh, yeah, close up. Right. There it is. <laughs> there. <laughs> there. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, listen, so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let us sign off here. Remember, you really are the smartest people in the room at your financial institution. You're the ones that have got all the knowledge. You're the ones that are going to make certain that the loans that are being made that the FDIC is going to look at are safe and sound. Uh -huh. And you're going to do that because you hang out with really cool peers that are there to help you as well. And thanks right. for your new photo as we leave it with that. I, I, I was looking for this and I had to show you. <laughs> Don't be a loser, Aaron. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so I, much, Daniel, for giving us the time of being a friend of five. And thanks to Thank all the members for spreading the Great word. For Love y'all. Thanks. Bye. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Bye. Thank you.